Thank you, Cosmin, for in introducing me. I think I'm going to cut or slash my um, text about myself because I've never heard it read out before in that way, and it's very long-winded and over the top, um, as one sometimes writes oneself up to in certain contexts. Anyway, I just want to say thank you to Cosmin and Ching Yi for inviting me um, to come and participate in these discussions, um, and also for the Parasite staff who've been really supportive um, and just rubbing my back just now and saying, go on, you can do it. So thank you, um, and for the great welcome. The next thing I wanted to say really is that it is a privilege um, to come and, and kind of participate in these sorts of discussions, but it's also daunting, um, especially because in the context of an international conference, whose focus today is on new internationalism, it's daunting because it feels as if we should already know some of the answers to the questions. After all, it seems as if we've been rehearsing these discussions, questions, agendas, for the past 20 years or so. And of course, if um, that's 20 years for me, but perhaps if you have done more art history, then it will go back further and more sort of sociology, you will have different starting points. And if you're older or younger, um, Anyway, so shouldn't we now be all conversant with the same terms of reference, um, know about the same shows and events, or even gone to them? But this is obviously not the case, um, and the art arena is a highly stratified, multi-dimensional place, and we need to keep this in mind. Equally, what's daunting is that when one does appear to agree, agree to appear on a platform of any sort, um, it is never clear who the audience is going to be, whether you bring to the discussions um, anything new or of interest or really of any relevance. So the other thing I wanted to um, say was thank you for the audience for coming. Um, and hopefully there will be a chance for more input from you as we go through the, the next few days. Um, I'd like to speak really um, uh, from a position of a practitioner who is located in London. Um, I'm going to take the next 50 minutes or so to take you on a journey through the terrain which informs and contextualizes my recent video work, Sensing, Sensing Obscurity, which is a three-part video work made last year. The presentation is not going to be chronological, but we'll shuttle backwards and forward through time, events, locations, and the video works themselves. After this, Chingmi and my, myself will have a discussion, and hopefully she'll sort of pull me back in, into to line. Um, and again, hopefully we'll hear more from the audience at this point. So, Sensing obscurity after chinoiserie is, um, is the last of the trilogy. Um, it's titled after chinoiserie um, to sort of play with the, the term after um, and to use the full spectrum of the word, including an after which signifies some kind of distance or rupture from, but also the kind of after which means following or continuing in the footsteps of. So if we um, can play the video and then I'll continue from then.
Um, so I've called my presentation Oriental Rift as a counter to the, to the term Oriental Riff, which is a musical term that features a small selection of repeated notes that has somehow come to signify the Orient. Used as a term of cultural referencing and geographic sonic transportation, the musical phrasing can be heard in the 1930s cartoon Betty Boop. <laughs> Or the 1970s hit, um, Kung Fu Fighting, and also in the f film theme to Bruce Lee's Enter the Dragon. You will have heard various renditions of it in the previous work, which in some respects is a history of its use and development. Just like the term Oriental, the Oriental Riff is a slippery term and has gone through various moments of being in circulation, out of circulation, contested, rebuked, and reclaimed. The riff can still be detected in use today, although used reflexively or ironically to parody Orientalist forms of representation. But it can equally turn up being put to use unintentionally, where it remains, or worse still, reinvests in Orientalist tropes, which you might otherwise expect to have expired by now. As for the term Oriental, in Britain it is now used by a network-savvy, younger East Asian generation to self-identify a form of racial or ethnic camaraderie, devoid of any knowledge of its contentious history and problematic past. This use is, exists alongside the post-colonial, post saidian academic discourses in play, but that's just it. Language has an uncanny way of working. Meanings are, meanings are constructed in time and in space. So for the purposes of transnational discourse in this conference, should we, and if we wanted to, 
How do we fix time and space so that we might find some common ground? And in particular, how do we do this within the context of a supposed ever-increasing, dematerialized, networked, borderless global world, which is forever reminding us of its ability to move faster than we can think? It's now faster for me to ask Google to remind me of a significant event or meaning than to recall it from my own memory. This, of course, should, in a truly, truly networked world, be universal. However, it is dependent upon the national borders you are located within, the technology you can afford to buy into, and your own specific abilities at memory core. And mine are pretty bad. So that's the plan, a global networked borderless world. Um, right, mustn't forget to use my slide shifter. Plan B, if you can't join them, uh, beat them, join them. Um, one June morning in 2012, the 900 or so inhabitants of the small alpine village of Hallstatt in Austria awoke to the news that several thousand miles away in the province of Guangdong, a replica village full scale, house for house, building for building, church tower, clock tower, and even the mountains and lakes were in the final stages of being built. Initially shocked and taken aback, people wondered how this had happened, and if it could happen, that is, if it was legal. After all, Hallstatt was added to the UNESCO World Heritage List in 1997, included for its specific and unique combination of environment, architecture, and local industry. Wouldn't Hallstatt be like an EUPDO, which is a European Union protected designation of origin projects, such as Greek feta cheese or Italian palm ham or French champagne? Since 1992, the EU has put in place policies to protect specific foods so as to maintain their authenticity. Intellectual property rights is a fascinating and highly complex arena which is constantly evolving. The UNESCO World Heritage Listing isn't so much a form of securing international property rights, but an attempt in securing the world's heritage for the future and acknowledging unique combinations of architecture, history, and culture. In terms of Hallstatt, its status as a UNESCO heritage site has meant an increase in tourism which has brought hundreds of thousands of tourists and millions of dollars each year. Chinese tourists, however, have never been very plentiful, but it was apparently under the guise of tourists that the Chinese developers came to photograph, map, and measure the intricacies of Hallstatt. By the time the residents of Hallstatt were actually aware of Hallstatt II, it was already, or it was already almost complete. There was no turning back, and from initial concerns and indignations, from media furore around replicas, copycat ripoffs, duplitecture, clones, and Xeroxes, the village has had to put plan B into action and, and embrace the situation, rapidly signing a cultural exchange and twinning with Hallstatt II. They have apparently found the new situation to be an economic bonus. So Hallstatt II becomes a calling card for the original Hallstatt, while the numbers of Chinese visitors to the real Hallstatt jumps from as few as 50 people a year to over 1,000 per year now. Starting in May this year, however, developments in Hallstatt III um, are going to commence. This time it's going to be encased in a climate-controlled biodome so as to reproduce the alpine conditions, allowing the existence of Hallstatt I's original flora and fauna and fresh alpine air. Hallstatt III is seen as a rural retreat for the rich. Hallstatt II is a residential and retail center. And what with the UNESCO World Heritage status, Hallstatt I seems destined to re remain unchanged, stuck in a time warp, rendered into a model, a prototype that can only survive by trading on its past. Um, the slogan, never meant to copy, only want to surpass, is a protest slogan issued by a Chongqing developer who is being sued by the architect Zaha Hadid for copyright infringement of a building she is designing in Beijing. Um, the curvy Chongqing building is not, the developer says, a reference to Zaha Hadid's building, but is in fact reflection of the cobblestones found on the banks of the Yangtze River near their development. One of Hadid's additional frustrations is that the Chongqing project looks set to be completed before hers which somewhat turns the relationship between the copy and original on its head. So, forward, we, forward rewind, replay, remake, repeat, chinoiserie and optic of, of looking. <clears throat> the term chinoiserie could in some context today purely reference the 18th century European design aesthetic which produced, whether in China or in Europe, commodi commodities such as porcelain, wallpaper, furniture, with Chinese symbols and references. Chinoiserie is a flexible term, incorporating export wares from China, made specifically for perceived Western taste, objects made in Europe to simulate Chinese objects, or it is also used in a more generalized way to refer to Chinese-style theming and interior design and architecture. 
The visual reference used were often fantastical and over-the-top depictions of supposed Chinese landscapes, people, animals, birds, and mythical creatures. It could be argued that chinoiserie aesthetics and processes are a precursor to today's interest in cut and paste, appropriation, and reuse. These processes of elaborate repetitive transcribing and translation were fundamental tools for reinscribing China as it was assumed to be, expected to be, or needed to be. Chinoiserie is far more than willow pattern porcelain, Dutch delfware, or Chippendale cabinets, but is a mediating optic, a particular way of seeing, looking, thinking, and at the time it was a mechanism for knowledge production and knowledge dissemination. There is also an important underlying story of economic relations to, the, to this visual oscillation. Take, for instance, the, the blue and white willow pattern tea sets, which are often seen as synonymous with England, but yet also strangely seen as quintessentially Chinese. Willow, willow pattern owes its origins to the early blue and white ceramic and porcelain ware that came from China. However, its designs and story behind the designs are British in origin. When Europe began importing porcelain from China, it was a highly prized commodity. Apparently, Louis XIII ate his breakfast from a bowl of Chinese porcelain, and Shakespeare in 1603 writes about China dishes in his writing Measure for Measure. China monopolized the technology in porcelain production up until the early 1700s, when a Jesuit priest managed to obtain this trade secret, which was then disseminated throughout Europe. So factories were set up, and by the end of the 1700s, there was enough European production to satisfy the European market and the importing of porcelain from China declines. Chinese-style porcelains still continue to be produced in Europe, and willow pattern becomes a stock design of every British pottery maker and is still being produced today, two centuries later. It is still seen as somehow emblematic of China of, or things Chinese, despite the expanded trade relations, contact, exchange, Chinese tourists, immigrants, British travel abroad, etc. So the past continues to haunt the present, and the chinoiserie optic is still in play although I'm not really sure what to make of um, the tea shop down Hollywood Road I saw yesterday that's full of Chinese chinoiserie blue and white um, porcelain. Anyway, um, I think the question is whether uh, chinoiserie can ever purely be a design feature or a sort of fashion. Um, the Google image search I made in 2011 for chinoiserie brought up over 130,000 images, but within the first 230, there is something interesting in operation. Backwards and forwards through time and space, there is a collapse between the erotic and the exotic, desire and otherness. I wonder how long this strange fantasy or love affair with things Chinese can be sustained. Radical gesture or nationalist sabotage, repatriation of cultural relics. In 2009, the antiques and art dealer Chai Ming Chao placed the highest bid on two bronze zodiac figureheads at a Christie's auction in Paris. Five days later, he called a pre press conference and claimed he would not be paying up. This was, he said, a patriotic act and a protest against the selling of looted treasure. The two heads, a rabbit and a rat, are part of a series of 12 zodiac animals, which were originally part of a fountain in Beijing's summer palace, designed by Je Jesuit priests and made by Chinese bronze makers. The 12 heads were looted by the British and French during this 1860s Second Opium War, and along with the hundreds of other items have ended up dispersed around the world in public and private collections. Prior to the auction, the Chinese government tried to have the sale of the two zodiac heads stopped, but were unsuccessful, and the French courts cleared the items for sale. In 2000, there was another unsuccessful intervention by the Chinese government to stop an auction of three other of the heads. The items were eventually brought um, bought through the auction by the Bureau of Cultural Relics in China, which is a government agency, and also another company which is noted to have very strong links with the PLA. These heads had also come up um, for auction a decade earlier, in 1987 and 1989, but this time China made no comment um, about the auctions. Chai Ming Chao's patriotic act is linked to broader debates around the, the repatriation of misappropriated artifacts. For the auction houses, it's more than the defaulting of, on several millions of pounds, but the status of future sales possibilities of these contested objects. And for collectors and museums, it questions the status of their collections. Whilst Chai says he was acting alone, there seems to be a lot of speculation as to how connected, supported, or sanctioned his actions have been by the Chinese government. It is estimated that over 1.6 million stolen Chinese relics now reside in over 2,000 museums in 47 countries and additionally in private hands. The Chinese State Bureau of Cultural Relics is pursuing the repatriation of these objects through political and diplomatic means. And where this doesn't work, the philanthropy and patriotism of wealthy businesses and individuals 
is also seen to be an action. Or in Chai's case, whilst not actually repatriating the bronze heads, his actions in the press coverage signals a changing dynamic of international relations. Seven of the bronze heads have now been located. Five of these are back in China, and the rest remain unfound. In 1995, Ang Lee, the Taiwanese filmmaker of Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, Brokeback Mountain, um, The Hulk, and most recently, The Life of Pi, shot part of his internationally acclaimed film, Sense and Sensibility, in a national trust house in England. This is often seen as his breakout film in which he moved from the multi multicultural discourses um, and narratives of Chinese diaspora in America or Taiwanese-centric works to what might be termed international. This international breakout required him to approach the period drama, more explicitly an English-speaking period drama written by Jane Austen in 1811. This was a couple of decades before the first um, Opium War took place. Ang attempted to inflict, uh, inflect a broader global referencing into the work, but for the most part produced a highly polished work which did not depart from the expectations of a typical English period drama. It would appear that this successful rendering of, a form, of the format made Ang Lee an international contender. The house that Ang Lee filmed in becomes the location of the next work I'm going to show you. It's a place called Saltram House, an old English manor house, which has become a museum due to the owners no longer being able to afford its upkeep and handing it over to the National Trust, which in Britain looks after houses and monuments for future generations. This house is well known for its Joshua Reynolds paintings, architecture, and interior designs. It also has a very good collection of Chippendale furniture. Thomas Chippendale was one of the leading cabinet makers in the 18th century. He also did a range of designs called Chinese Chippendale, which was very inf influential and copied and adapted by many of his predecessors. What's also of note is that the house has some very good examples of chinoiserie interiors and Chinese wallpapers. For the most part, however, time seems to stand still in Saltram. As a heritage project, although it is open to the public for part of the year, it remains mostly shut, excluding light, visitors, and the passing of time. The clocks in Saltram House only work during opening months. For the rest of the year, they are packed away in muslin cloths. The next work is a two-channel video piece. It's just over 28 minutes long, um, and it's set some point in the not-too-distant future. So I'll play that, and I'll continue after it.
Chang An, Xi'an, Gansu, Langzhou, Wu Wei, Yumen, Anxi, Donghuan, Hami, Turfan, Urumqi, Alma Atta, Tianshan, Kola, Aksu, Kotan, Taklamakan, Kashka, Bishkin, Namangan, Bagana, Tashkent, Samarkand, Turkmanabad, Bukhara, Mer, Meshad, Caspian, Baki, Ashgabat, Tehran, Yamansha, Baghdad, Damascus, Adama, Izmir, Selis, Alexander, Constantinople, Rome.烧出来两个月Georgian mahogany, Corinthian column candlestick, Rococo ceiling, Joseph Perfetti table, symmetrical Palladian facade, Tudor timber, 
Damari porcelain figurine, Joshua Reynold portrait and all, Italian gilt wood table, Venetian window, Chippendale chemiserie keyhole, Etienne Lenoir clock, crimson frock wallpaper, Robert Adam neoclassical chimney piece and matching carpet, Ming vase, Wedgwood black basalt ware, Etruscan plaster urns, Kansi black Dachine Guanyin, Red Bracier marble, Paddock wood pagoda shaped pressing ware, Pale blue damask wall, Familiar work dog of foe, Regency Derek Pintico, Delph ware, Neoclassical packed on fire Thomas Chippendale Giltwood armchair and sofa suite, Emperor Nova marble bust, Scagliola column, Ming from Milrose Jug, Francesco Vesali, Overmantle.
莎白，那时候伊丽莎白是个那么美的一个女性，当时她就是我们心目中的女神。那个迈克呢，戴着那个，现在我们叫它蛤蟆镜、太阳镜，那个时候我们叫迈克镜，其实就是一副茶色的墨镜，那么帅。我那么小就想我们长大点，赶快弄个那个墨镜。后来我一上初中就弄了一个墨镜，人五人六的戴着。听进了风雪，谁的爱就是悲，尘埃是飞。Rolling, play. 
下可以了，把灯开一下，灯开一下。灯在哪？那灯，我怎么知道？真的。在哪里？在哪里？看这个吗？看这个在这边。嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯
Alexandria, Cilicia, Iznik, Adana, Damascus, Baghdad, Kamansha, Tehran, Ashgabat, Baki, Caspian, Mashhad, Mer, Bukhara, Turkmenabat, Samarkand, Pagana, Namangan, Bishkek, Kashgar, Taklamakan, Khotan, Aksu, Kula, Jianshan, Alma Atta, Ulumuchi, Tofu, Ami, Donghuan, Ansi, Yuman, Wu Wei, Lan Zhao, Gansu, Tian, Okay, um, well, there are a lot of people that worked on that with me, so I probably should let it run. Um, I'm just conscious that you've all been sitting down for a long time, so should we get the slide on? Yeah, okay. Um, Okay, so this is um, a next section called Tripping, Troping, Eastward, Westward, Exhibition Histories, UK. The following slides are a series of exhibitions and conference titles selected over a 15-year period in the UK with a focus on Chinese art. If exhibitions and conferences are seen as producers of knowledge, then what does the reading in t over time of these events tell us? From 1995 to 2010, there are three major events which are significant in the cultural discourse around Chinese art in Britain. The first in 1997 is the Hong Kong handover. The second in 2007 is its 10-year anniversary. And the third is the Beijing Olympics in 2008. Each event stimulated a rash of Chinese shows, conferences, and events whose titles I would like, um, or I would argue, can be read as a reflection of shift shifting concerns and engagements. These shifts would go something like this. Diasporic dislocations, multiculturalism, identity politics, issues of representation, journeys and encounters, to Chinese modernisms, Chinese art markets, and the visual culture of China. I'm going to play the um, slides without any commentary, but please note uh, the first and the last of the slides.
Okay, so there is a sort of complete reversal um, for, uh, in terms of journeys west, and then we end at journeys to the east, or journey to the east. Um, let me get to the next section. Dogs, pigs, pigs, lanterns, gates, and poisonous chalices, commissioning frameworks in the UK. In the last decade, despite exhibitions in the UK becoming more engaged with China directly, in contrast, commissioning agendas within the UK still carried multicultural agendas, interpreting and manifesting a particularly instrumentalized relationship between the arts and society at large. The arts were a key ex exponent of the government's cultural diversity policies, enforcing the celebration of difference, which manifested as a further popularizing of vernacular imaginings of Chinese culture. This seemed at odds with the more international developments of contemporary Chinese art, where an explosion of competing and challenging representations were being enacted. Whilst, um, whilst the exhibition, The Real Thing, in 2007 took place at Tate Liverpool, was showing a range of ambitious new commissions by artists in China, such as Ai Weiwei, Chao Fei, and Su Zhen. Um, in contrast, British Chinese artists were being asked to send in proposals which ambitiously and experimentally responded to the theme of the pig. Indeed, as artists, we were being asked to show our red cards and perform a notion of Chineseness which could be seen as still as other, but another which was knowable, familiar, and containable. And the last of this collection is here. So um, I'd like to end this presentation with the last of the Sensing Obscurity trilogy um, called Chinese Chippendale. It's a work made to be encountered primarily on the internet as opposed to being shown alongside the other two works in the gallery space. It's a work that seems to me to epitomize um, the orc, oh, not that one. Um, it, it's a work that seems to me to epitomize the awkwardness of the present moment, of trying to move forward and adapting to the changing circumstances in an attempt to try and remain viable, current, and relevant, finding new positions and meanings to old material, being compromised and selling out, being out of sync, out of time, and out of touch, getting it wrong, being clumsy, looking at others to help you find your place, and endlessly, endlessly, endlessly being in some kind of rehearsal.
you can start. This is um, awkward. So basically, like, you know, we started a conversation earlier during our Skype conversations, the mm -hmm. idea of like how this idea of internationalism, the use of it, the idea of Chinese, it's kind of obliterates the nuances, the pluralism behind it. I mean, like there are a lot of ways that we talk about identity politics, the whole idea of the ethnic is absolutely lost in this. So it's like my question is like, is there a way of formulating such a way that um, such plur plurality of vocabularies actually come into play? Um, I, don't, I, 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 I don't know, really. I think, um, for me, one of the things about this work is um, an incessant inability to somehow move forward um, and, um, and make a break with the past. And sort of, on the one hand, really desiring it. Um, I, I think... In a way, the reason I've sort of shown this... I'm not going to answer your question directly, of course. Of course. Right? Um, so the reason I've sort of done what I've done today is partly because um, some of the way that I've worked has come out so strongly from the context that I'm making the work in. So the vocabularies and the discussions that take place in Britain around multiculturalism have very much informed the way I've um, made the work, but also have informed... Um, my existence as an artist. So at times I've, um, you know, I've, I've lived off government money that is specifically for somebody that might be called a Chinese artist in Britain. Um, and so therefore I'm sort of complicit with the whole system. Um, and I've also felt that at times that I, uh, me and other people that have been um, vested in these discussions we have at some point in rather felt that we were trying to attempt to engage with these dialogues so that we could take the dialogue forward. Um, but what sort of, we've been hit by a sideways blow and not being able to actually preempt what perhaps the Hong Kong handover meant, um, but also the rise of China has, got, has meant. Um, and so I think my situation at the moment is um, actually being quite lost and not sure um, how the vocabularies are being used, what's at stake when people use them. I, I know some of the bigger discourses, so the interest in China and Britain has very much been around the rise of sort of Chinese market and the Chinese economy. Um, but you know, n now there, is, there, there was a conference um, this year which is around contesting what British Chinese means, and we've done that so many times, And but what does it mean now? And so, in a way, um, again, which all the speakers have commented upon, which is, what what does this term mean? Who's, who, whose reference, whose sort of um, arena does it come into? Um, and how are people using it? How does it operate? Um, and I, I think we're probably all using it very differently. Yeah, the point of reference is always shift a bit. And like, I, th I think what was interesting with your work was like the sense of kind of a bit of the um, ambiguity behind it as mm -hmm. well. Like you could almost say it. Like, I mean, at the same time that I was like kind of con looking at the visual images, like especially for sensing obscurity number one, and like there were f the dances that you use, obviously there were heralding some of it. One of them was like using capoeira, which was, um, mm -hmm. which was predominantly traditionally um, a defense, martial arts mm -hmm. used by slaves. Yeah. who had their hands bound, um, bound together. And I also meant to ask whether there was any reference that you pulled out of that. Um, uh, yes, not, not necessarily specifically the capoeira. Um, but I think capoeira and also kind of kung fu move, moves, they all have um, sort of very specific kind of histories and reference points. Um, it's it's kind of um, it's a moment in time. There's sort of two forms of dance in this piece, and um, in a way, the that piece was a sharing energy moment, um, and the guys were all um, in a way slightly free form dancing, coming to it with their own particular um, interests in dance, um, whereas the last piece was a very choreographed. Um, piece uh, set, you know, set around pre, 
choreographed moves that the Chippendales do, which is the Chippendales are a branded um, organization and their, their moves are copyrighted and so is their name. Um, so if anything, I suppose, is slightly trying to f not really produce a binary, because I, I think equally the guys are also asked to, to dance by me. But um, So in some respects, they've chosen the kind of dance moves that they wanted to do. Um, but it's interesting that there's a cert there, there is a sort of fighting talk that's going on, um, but very tamed. Okay. Um. But also, like, I mean, we'll also be, I mean. I yes. <laughs> I think this was the moment in time that we're going to have a conversation with you guys. Yeah.